Hello and welcome to the first in our series, Road to Tokyo. I'm Tracy Holmes. We're now in the countdown to the start of the 2021 Summer Olympics. Over the next six weeks, we'll discuss the big news stories of the week, profile one of our medal hopefuls and take a look at life in the Japanese capital. But first, Olympian Maddie Groves shocked the swimming world when she quit the Tokyo trials, citing misogynistic perverts in the sport. Swimming Australia has conceded the organisation could have done better with its independent complaints process, acknowledging recent changes hadn't been publicised to the athletes. This past week has brought back some memories former Australian swimmer Sally Hunter thought she had purged. Sally also says while there has been change, she's disappointed it hasn't been fast enough or thorough enough. I think that um, what's happening now is probably a good thing. I think that what's happened in the past sort of 12 months with gymnastics and now probably swimming is that um, they're going to start, sports are going to have to start realising that they might have done things wrong in the past and it's time for change um, and real change, like actually standing up and saying we, we, we accept that we've made a mistake or, you know, we know that things have happened in the past and that's not going to happen again and we're going to go forward and do some and you know look after our women in sport and our athletes. My last coach was absolutely fantastic and was such a holistic coach and really cared about my well-being and who I was as a human being not just about my results in the pool but I did have a coach that probably didn't care that much or tried to manipulate sort of us girls into to trying to do what um to pit us off against each other and to be better athletes and um, I don't think that worked particularly well um Look, I was, in, I was on cool deck for the past four years as an athlete and as a coach, and I think that things have changed. Um, but I also know that a lot of these coaches haven't changed in the past 20 years. Like a lot of these coaches have been around for a really long time. And I think that they have said, yeah, I don't notice any of that anymore. But what happens, you know, 10 years ago when they saw something happen in front of their eyes and they did nothing about it? Have they just forgotten about that too? Have they just ignored the fact that that person's still on pool deck next to them and thought that, well, maybe he's just changed? Because do people, um, do, you know, as, as, do people make that much change? And, and hopefully they do. I think that, um, like I said, I was um, part of a coaching a staff that had amazing leadership women in it and I was really well supported by the staff around me. But, um, yeah, I'd like to think that it's changed. As a coach on pool deck, um, I knew a lot of different coaches and I thought that they really cared and, and supported their athletes really, really well, especially the ones that um, I knew quite well. Um, yeah, like, like I said, I think in the past things have happened and why wasn't that addressed in the past? Um and then those coaches are still coaching. So have they changed? I don't know. We asked Swimming Australia President Kieran Perkins to join us, but he declined. The ABC's national sports reporter David Mark has been poolside all week at the Olympic swimming trials and joins us now from Adelaide. David, we know that what has happened in the pool has been completely overshadowed by what's happened outside of the pool in years gone by, but there have been some incredible highlights, which means we're sending a pretty awesome team to Tokyo. We really are, Tracy. I mean, the, the pool, the swimming this week has been absolutely stunning and particularly the women and the highlights really have been Ariane Titmus and Kaylee McEwen. Kaylee McEwen, of course, um, uh, had that world record in the 100 metres backstroke, a, a stunning time. But Ariane Titmus in both the 400 and the 200 metres freestyle uh, recorded the second fastest times in history. And for that 200 metres record in particular, that dates back to 2009. It's a longest standing world record in women's swimming and it was set in the super suit era by the Italian Federica Pellegrini. She got within about a tenth of a second of that record. So that just shows she's in absolutely awesome form. And I suppose it was really uh, highlighted last, um, highlighted on uh, Wednesday night in the women's 4 by 100 metre freestyle race, Emma McKeon just beat her long-standing rival, rival Kate Campbell. Um, but the top six women in that race all set qualifying times. Now, to put that into some kind of context, Swimming Australia sets a really high bar for who can qualify for the Olympics. It bases their times on the eighth best place getter at the last World Championships, which was in 2019. So essentially what that's saying is that the top six women in the 100 metres freestyle in Australia are all capable of making the final at a World Championships. 
So there really is some exceptional form. The women have been amazing. The men have been good too. Um, Kyle Chalmers is getting back into some sort of form. He won the 100 metres freestyle, but there's a lot of excitement around Elijah Winnington, who won the 400 metres freestyle and set the fastest time in the world this year. So while the women have really been dominating, particularly those up and coming women, there is some hope for the men as well. David, thanks for that. And uh, just to provide some further context, the women have always been the backbone of the Australian Olympic team. All right, Annabelle Smith has had a less than desirable lead up to her third Olympic Games with restrictions preventing her from earning a qualifying spot in the synchronised diving, an event she claimed bronze in in Rio. Annabelle will be heading to Tokyo where she'll compete as a solo diver. She shares her good news with us in her Road to Tokyo diary. Today is actually a super exciting day because I have officially been announced on the team for Tokyo for my third Olympic Games. It's been an absolute whirlwind of stress and anxiety and lots of emotions over the past couple months of training leading into our Olympic trials, but I had a really great performance in the pool at our nationals, which doubled as our nomination trials for the Olympics last week. So finished top two in women's three metre and will be going over to Tokyo to compete as an individual diver for my first time ever as the other two Olympics I've been to have been for synchro. So I'm so grateful for everybody's support and the support of my family and my coaches and entire team who without them none of this is possible. So I'll keep you guys updated now on my lead into Tokyo and I cannot wait. Well, let's stay in Adelaide and speak with Paralympians Ahmed Kelly and Grant Scooter Patterson, who have made the Paralympic swim team. It's a team that measures 32 in number, and you two are most definitely the stars of the show before you've even hopped into the pool in Tokyo. What is it about you two? I always thought Olympic and Paralympic swimming was a serious business, but you two are a laugh a minute. You've got to have fun in life. You know, we're all about the bikes. Um, and you can't take it too serious, otherwise it'd be boring. Yeah, I mean, like, he takes it fun, and I, I sometimes take it pretty serious. But uh, yeah, we kind of uh, well, even, even it out. It out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I was watching you two swimming in in the qualification trials through the week, and um, it certainly was serious business. You both look in really good form. You met in London, didn't you, at the 2012 Paralympic Games? Is that where the friendship began, or was it before then? 2008. When you can't go home the rest. Yeah. <laughs> and his goggles fell off and we become good mates then. Yeah, yeah, he thought I was an absolute clown. Oh, so I know he had to put my goggles down. Was his neck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we kind of really hit it off at the London 2012 Pound of Bix. We lived together, we got up we got up to a lot of mischief. And uh yeah, we've just been lucky to be able to remain friends, I haven't killed each other yet. Yeah. So that's great. We're still going. There's been some highs and lows, I know, for both of you in your swimming career, but does it look like you've hit perfect form now heading to Tokyo? It, it definitely, uh, for me, it looks good. Um, I, after I missed out on Rio four or five years ago, um, I've gone and worked a lot harder in the gym. Um, but I'm definitely at my best form so far, um, and I'm looking forward to Tokyo. Yeah, and I, I didn't have the perfect race yet, uh, but that's the thing, we've got eight weeks to really get back into training, uh, work out the, the things that didn't quite go our way at these trials, and yeah, come, in, uh, come even stronger uh, when we get to the power of the games. Can you give us a bit of detail about your training sessions, what's involved, what else you do in your day-to-day -day life, and how this one-year delay has impacted both of you? Has it given you the chance to, in some ways, get better? Myself, uh, living up in Cairns, I was very lucky. Um, I could sneak into a few pools and do training the whole time. Um, but if anything, I've enjoyed it because we pretty much had like a year off racing and competition last year. Um, and we can sort of sit back and relax without having any pressure. Um, and then come into this year stronger and better. So I, I, I've done pretty well. And, you know, it's been... Yeah, and... and th in, in my uh, in, in my position, like uh, we had a lot of time off the pool, uh, but I know that everybody was in the same boat, and a lot of them had different challenges as well. So for me, as soon as I got back in the pool, it was more about getting the feel again, 
it's about uh, trying to work on the uh, performance of building building to trials rather than go all hammer and tongue straight away because yeah, it could set us back with injury. So just try and be a bit more uh, reasonable with the start and then yeah, build towards trials. And uh, it's just so so happy that I'm on the, uh, the on the team to go to Tokyo again. So talking about Tokyo, what is it that you have in your mind? What what is it that realistically you are going to achieve? And if you don't achieve it, how disappointing would it be? At the moment, we do, we're not really thinking too much about the outcome. It's more about the process of what we think will do, or put together a great race. Uh, I mean, the goal is to finish top three. Uh, but again, to really work on our process, uh, really try and control the things that we were able to, uh, and hopefully the outcome will sort itself out. Um, we all have different uh, disappointments, but uh, we'll deal with them if it happens. But at this stage, we're pretty positive that we're going to have a really good race. But back in London, when I made my first Paralympic team, 2012, I learned when you focus too much on the outcome, um, that's when you can get very disappointed. Um, but if you focus on what I mean just said, the process of how you're going to get to the end result, as long as you train and argue the right thing during the week, leading up to whatever competition you're going to, that's when the rewards come. But yeah, I can, well, myself, I don't worry about, well, obviously there's a, a figure up in the head that you're worrying about the outcome, but focus on the process of how to get there. And if you do that, then you're confident on the day, and that's why we had the races last week. It's fabulous to have you both on the program. Thank you. Can you give me one of your signature sign-offs? Bit of a salute? Bit of a farewell. <laughs> the Tokyo Olympics could need a public bailout if the Games go ahead without crowds. Reporter Eleni Soltis looks at what's gone wrong. Remember this guy? Former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's surprise appearance as the much-loved Italian plumber was meant to mark the start of a smooth transition to the Tokyo Games. It's been anything but smooth. Let's start with the grand centrepiece of the Games, the Olympic Stadium. Tokyo already had one, the one from 1964, but there were no plans to revamp it. Instead, it was going to be replaced by this. Critics called it the bike helmet. When Shinzo Abe got wind of it reaching the $2 billion price tag, it was quickly scrapped and it was back to the drawing board. And the controversy hasn't ended there. There have been allegations of bribery to secure hosting rights, not to mention allegations of plagiarism over the original logo for the games. Spot the difference? And the timing of the Olympics has also been a contentious point. For the past three decades, except for the Sydney 2000 Games, the Olympics have been held in July and August because the sports calendar is fairly light during these months, making it great for TV ratings. But it's also when it's really, really hot in Japan. They try to fix this with the plans to reseal Tokyo's roads with heat shielding material for the marathon runners. It didn't cut it though. Now the marathon will be held in the north Tokyo was also meant to be the recovery games for a nation on the mend after the devastating 2011 earthquake, tsunami and triple nuclear meltdown. It was also meant to be the cool and eco-friendly games with plenty of Japanese mascots on show. And 80,000 tons of old electrical goods, including 6 million mobile phones, recycled to create 5,000 Olympic medals. But then the pandemic struck and the cool games was put on the freeze. Originally, it was thought the games would cost just over $7 billion. But with COVID pushing the games back to this year, the budget has more than tripled and Japan is still counting its losses. That's because it was counting on visitors. Japan had high hopes it would reach a record 40 million foreign visitors for 2020. There has also been little appetite for the games locally. Even the torch relay has been a bit of a non-event. Like the demolished 64 stadium, so many plans and expectations for the games have been smashed. But one thing is for certain, never trust the budget forecasts.
Thanks for watching. I'm Tracy Holmes. We'll be back next week on the road to Tokyo.